Well, if you have your copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 9 of Deuteronomy chapter 6 this morning as we talk about fathers and we talk about what the Lord's instructions to us as fathers are. So, um, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9, tells us a lot about what we are supposed to do as fathers. So I want to invite you to stand with me, and we'll read this passage of Scripture together, stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. So uh, if you would, please stand. Deuteronomy chapter 6, Scripture says, For this is my command, the statutes and the ordinances the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, so that you may follow them in the land you are about to enter and possess. Do this so that you may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life by keeping all His statutes and commands I am giving you, your son, your grandson, and so that you may have a long life. Listen, Israel, and be careful to follow them so that you may prosper and multiply greatly because the Lord your God of your ancestors has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. And this is His command in verse 4. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These words I am giving you today are to be on your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let the symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the truth of Your Word. We thank You that we have been taught that You are uh, our God. You are one. And that we should love You with our heart, our soul, and our strength. And Father, I pray that You would just give us the power through Your Holy Spirit and by Your Word that we can accomplish uh, this holy endeavor. And Father, I pray that as fathers especially, that You would just empower us to do Your work. So Father, as we look at Your Word today, I pray that You would help us to understand just a little bit more about how to be uh, fathers and, and parents in general. In Jesus' name, Amen. You may be seated. You can follow along in the worship guide, if you like. Uh, as I was looking at this, I looked at some statistics. And it's interesting how our, our families have deteriorated. You know, uh, divorce rates continue to skyrocket. We live in an age where commitments are, uh, are disintegrating. We have no responsible responsibilities to our families. Commitments to marriage have deteriorated. In fact, many years ago, when I first got out of seminary, there was a young girl that was in our youth group. And uh, she uh, came to me one day. In fact, Jane and I were waiting with her for her parents to come pick her up. So this was like, I don't know, 91 or 2. And so this little girl was talking to us and she said, You know what? I'll get married two times and get divorced two times. And the third one will probably be the one that I stay with. And I said, What are you talking about? She goes, That's what my mother and daddy have done. And so I figured that's what will happen to me. Isn't that, that's been 30 years ago almost. Isn't that a picture of what's going on in our world today? You know, uh, I just looked at some stats here. In 1960, the divorce rate was 1 in 30 marriages, and today it's almost 50%. The average marriage in the United States lasts 8.2 years. 1.1 million kids were in single parents' homes in 1960. By 1983, that had risen to 5.8 million kids. And today, there are 21 million kids in single parent homes across our country. You know, it's because the marriage has fallen apart. We have no commitment to marriage. Those who should not be married have campaigned to be married, homosexuals. But those who can be married, heterosexuals, have shunned away from marriage. In fact, cohabitation has increased dramatically. It's a common occurrence. A few, I read a Pew Research article that said that, that, that most uh, people who cohabitate, who live together uh, before marriage... See, the irony is that we expect this sinful world to sin, don't we? We expect sinners to sin. But most of the statistics that we find here, many of them claim Christ. Many of them claim to be believers in the Lord Jesus. Many of them claim to follow Jesus with their heart. Many have been reared in Christian homes, have been reared in the church. 
And yet, they're not living a life that God has given them. They're not living that plan that the Lord has given us. You see, the Lord has a plan for our families, doesn't He? He has a plan for your family. He has a plan for us to be successful, for us to be whole. He did not establish the family for it to fail, for it to be a failure. But in His Word, He has given us His plan. He has given us a plan for the wholeness of His family. And folks, I want you to hear me say, the family, uh, the plan for God's family is in the home. It's not in the church. It's in the home. Now the church come alongside and partners with our families to give us that Christian home. But God's family, or God's uh, plan for the family is in the home. And God's Word gives us that success. He tells us that we all have responsibilities, don't we? Mothers have a part of responsibility. Certainly, children have a responsibility. But today, I want us to talk about fathers. Primarily, they are responsible for the family. I know that's contrary to what the culture tells us. I know that we hear all kinds of different uh, philosophies today in our, in our uh world about um, the roles of genders and and what we're supposed to do. But the Word of God is very clear that the primary responsibility for the home rests on the father. The father is a responsible party for the family. He is the provider for his family. Paul told Timothy, if anyone does not provide for his own family, especially for his household, he's denied the faith and he's worse than an unbeliever. The father is the provider. The father is the protector of his family. Jesus said, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his possession unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder the house. So the father is the protector. The father is the provider. But the father is also the pastor of the family. Did you know that? We've read that in our passage this morning. Is that Moses came... And he told the fathers how they were to disciple, rear their children in the knowledge that God is one and how he should go about doing that. And that role is what I want to talk to us a little bit about today. You see, he has given us, the Lord has given us instructions about how to be godly fathers. And the first thing I want us to point out is that he told us to listen intently. Listen intently. Verses 3 and 4 tells us to listen. Here, Israel, listen. Have you ever been told you can't uh, listen if you're talking? That's been told to me on a couple of occasions through the years. Is that you can't listen if you're talking. Be quiet and listen. He tells us to listen. He tells us to listen to the vital truth that there is one God. There's one God. Well, we say, well, we accept the fact that there's one God, but yet we live our lives as if we don't believe that, don't we? We go out and we make things that are not important, important in our life. Our jobs, the money that we make, the positions that we have in our life, sports figures and athletic events, uh, the teams that we, that we support. Our children, sometimes we're even worshiping our children over the Lord Himself putting them before any other activity. The Lord tells us that there's one God and that everything else in our life is viewed by that view, through that, uh, that vital truth, is that God is one and everything else is viewed through God and that relationship. It's not an add-on. It's not in addition to. He is one. He is the center of our life. And listening requires us to make a concerted effort. It requires us to put everything out of our head and pay attention Use the ears of our heart, if you will, to hear what the Lord has to say. This thing, it takes a little time, doesn't it? It takes time. It takes personal devotion. It takes an interest in what's being said. It takes worship. It takes being in the Word of God. It takes memorizing the Word of God. It takes giving yourself and being on your knees. I can tell you that when Jane, we found out that the kids were pregnant, or Jane was pregnant with our kids, that personally I wanted to name those kids early. I wanted to find out if they were boys or girls. You know why? Because I wanted to name them. I wanted to be able to pray by, uh, by name for those kids. And there's not been too many days since I found out that, that Jane was pregnant with our boys that I haven't prayed by name for those kids. I wanted to, to give myself to prayer. I wanted to listen intently. Jesus said, blessed are those who hear the Word of God and keep it. How do we uh, hear the Word of God and keep it? By knowing the Word, by being in the Word. You can't hear it if you're not listening. 
You can't talk and listen at the same time. He tells us in verses 3 and 4 to listen intently. Listen that God is one. And all the other things that we have tried to elevate in our life, they're taking a position that is before God. God is one. And we're never going to be able to hear our families if we're not listening to the truth that there's one God. But He also tells us to listen to the individual needs of our family, doesn't He? To show interest into our family. If we're going to answer our family, we have to know the truth of God. You see, there's not a way for us to understand our family if we're not understanding what it means to be a father, what it means to be a man of God. We have to answer the truth of God. We get busy, don't we, in our life? Let's just be fair about it. I know it's hard. It's, it's busy to go, go, go all the time. It is. I have a, a, that little car that we've got has a, an ability to take texts uh, on it. You know, you can have put your phone up to it and text will come through this little screen. And um, when we were in our church out in West Tennessee, I couldn't go to work without there being two, three texts coming on the screen. So we come over here to LMU and I said, Jane, I think the cars quit working on the, the screen. And she said, why? I said, well, there's not text coming through it anymore. And then I realized because no one was texting me anymore. It wasn't the car. We get busy, don't we? We get so busy that we don't know if we're coming or going. We get so busy that we can't listen to the Lord. We can't listen to our families. We can't listen to anything. We get, if you're like me, you get, you get busy and you get so aggravated because you're just going all the time. And then things that become get-tos become have-tos. Things that you want to give your attention to. The most important people in your life get the leftovers of your life. There was a man... He was living that life. He was frustrated and he was being short with his family. He was being aggravated all the time. Little things that were important to him became nuisances to him. And he said, I remember distinctly after supper one evening that the words of my younger daughter, she came and she wanted to tell him something that had happened to her that day. And she began by saying, Daddy, I want to tell you something, but I want to tell you really fast. And he said, well, honey, you do you don't, he realized that she was upset. He goes, you don't, you don't have to say it really fast. You can tell me slowly. And she says, then you have to listen slowly. Oftentimes, we want to get through things, don't we? We want to check boxes so that we can move on. That's not listening. That's not giving time. That's not giving of ourselves. You'll never know what your family needs if you don't listen to them. You'll never know what's important if you're not listening. You see, if you're not listening to God, you'll never know what the priorities are in life so that when you hear your families, you'll understand how to put those in the proper place. Proverbs says, My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, listening closely to the wisdom and directing your heart to understanding, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. But see, what we want to do is we want to open the Word and then get to the part at the end where we have understanding of the knowledge of God. But we can't do that, can we? Because He says that we have to store up the commands within us. We have to listen closely to the wisdom. We have to direct our hearts to that. Then we'll understand. There's a lot between beginning of listening and to the end of understanding. We have to be in the Word. We have to be on our knees. My kids were growing up since they were little children. When they could first start talking, I asked them this question. Psalms 119.9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. I'd forgotten all about that. I forgot. I mean, we, I asked those kids that wherever we were going. We were going into Walmart, I'd ask them that question. We'd get in the car, I'd ask them that question. When they put them into bed, I'd ask them that question all the time. Hey, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to his word. And then my son reminded me of that just a few weeks ago. He said, Dad, do you remember that? I'd forgotten about that. By keeping it according to your word. You see, how can you keep the word of God if you don't know the word of God? How can you live a life that's of Christ if you don't know what Christ's words are in the, in the Word of God? It's not just about memorizing something and not understanding it. It's about living it. Being an expert in living the, the godly life that He's called us to be. Listening to what He has for us. You remember Douglas MacArthur, MacArthur General MacArthur. 
He was uh, one of the two generals that was responsible for winning World War II, as you know. And he had written a memoir, and he said that back when he was at West Point, he was in a, a science class, and what later was formulated as Einstein's theory of relativity. It was a time-space relationship. He had read this textbook, and he recognized that he just couldn't understand it, so he memorized the textbook word for word. And so when he went to class, his professor asked him uh, about that, and he just reeled off word for word this uh, section of the book. And his professor looked at him and said, do you understand what you just said? And he said, I, I recognize that that was going to be a bad moment for me, so I braced myself and I said, no, sir, I don't. And the, and the teacher looked at him and said, neither do I. Class dismissed. You can't teach something you don't know. You can't live out something you don't know. You can't do that. We can't be godly men without the Word of God in our life. If we're not listening that there is one God, nothing else is more important than that. If we're not listening in the context of there's one God, that we have children that want to come and talk to us. They do. You see, we have to listen intently to God. Listen intently to family. We must listen to His Word. We must listen to His will. He's going to enable us. He's going to equip us to understand His Word, to, to apply it to our life. There's going to be instances in your life that you would think, I read that weeks ago. I had no understanding about how that would apply. And then your son or daughter is going to come to you. Maybe your grandson or daughter will come to you. And you'll have opportunity to connect the dots. Being the pastor of the home, you see. God's called us to listen intently as fathers. He's called us to listen to there's one God and to listen to our families. But He's also called us to love intensely. You see, when you recognize what God wants for you, it's going to cause you to love your families intensely. Now, we all love our, our, our families. I think uh, lost people love their families. But we love with the power of the blood of Christ. You see, we have the, the, the Holy Spirit within us who supercharges our understanding and our ability to love our children. We have to, to teach them to determine to place God as the highest person in their life, to, to have the person of highest devotion, highest affection in their life. Verse 2 of our passage says, Do this so that you may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life by keeping all His statutes and commands. I am giving you your son and your grandson so that they may have a long life. Do God's business God's way. And living a life on this earth is doing God's business God's way. Did you know that, that fathers, your children, grandfathers, your grandchildren are learning what a Christian man is from you? Have you ever thought about that? That they may not know what a Christian man is. They may never have seen a godly man other than you. There's a story I ran across. I, I may have told this before. I love this story. There was a Spanish uh, father. They lived in Spain, and he and his, his son had become estranged. There was some, uh, some problem had developed in their relationship to the point that the son ran away from home. And his, son, his father searched for him everywhere. He looked everywhere for his son, but he could not find him to the point of desperation. And so he went to the Madrid newspaper, and he took out a classified ad. And he said, uh, in the ad, he said, Dear Paco, this was his son's name, Dear Paco, please meet me in front of the newspaper office noon this coming Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. Saturday came around at noon, and there were 800 people named Paco. You know what? They were all looking for forgiveness. From their fathers. They were all looking for love from their fathers. They were looking for their fathers. Are you loving your children in ways that reflect the love of our Heavenly Father? Are you forgiving their uh, mistakes? Are you holding it over them? John said, what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And then he continues and says, and that is what we are. God claims us as his children. He claims us. He says, that's my boy. That's my girl. 
He lavishes His love on us. Fathers, we got to accept our children as they are. If you're an athlete and your child's a musician, let them be a musician. If you're a musician and they're an athlete, let them be an athlete. If they're academic, let them be an academic. If they're mechanically inclined, let them be mechanically inclined. Don't make them be who you are. Let them be who God made them to be. Don't make them feel uh, discouraged. Paul says, fathers, don't provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Encourage the man or the woman that God's called them to be. Don't make them be mini-me's of you. Let them be who God wants them to be. We have to love and accept our kids. We've got to love them. Because you know what? There's someone out there that's going to give them some attention. If you don't do it, they'll do it. We've got to love them, but at the same time, we've got to hold on to them. Give them a firm direction. Always be in there. Proverbs says, whoever spares the rod hates his son. But who loves him is diligent in disciplining him. It's not talking about abuse. It's not talking about uh, being harmful. He's talking about, I love you enough to correct you. We see that same theme throughout Scripture uh, where the Holy Spirit comes and gives us direction and correction and discipline in our life. But what a striking message here is that if a father does not discipline his child, he hates the child. Why? Because if I'm invested in a child, I'm going to be all in. I'm in. We're exampling what a Christian man looks like. Men, your daughters will seek to marry a man that looks like you. That's the truth. And your sons will strive to become a man that looks like you. You're an example. You may be a bad example or a good example. But there's no denying the fact that you're an example. The Lord says, be a good example. We've got to love our families with the love that, that God gives us, that, that it permeates them, that submerges them in the acceptance and the love that God calls for us, that we receive. Let me just read these verses again, 6 through 9 of our passage. These words, these words I'm giving you today are to be on your heart. They're, they're supposed to permeate your being. Re- repeat them to your children all, of, all the time. That's the conversation. That's not the add-on. That's the, the life. That's the context. That's the platform. Talk to them about, uh, about it when you sit in your house, when you walk alongside the road, when you lie down, when you get up, when you're living life as you go. Bind them as a sign to your hand when you do things. Let them be a symbol on your forehead when you think things. Write them on the doorposts of your house. What's the, if there's a safe place in our world, it should be your home. Safe, acceptable. I can come in there and be who God's made me to be. And as we go around in our city gates, is your home a place of safety, of forgiveness, of acceptance, of Christ-centered love? Are you listening intensely to what God tells us, that He is one? That we have to listen to our families, that we have to love intensely. Do you... Do you love your kids that much? I used to tell my kids, I don't know what I was expecting for a son, but you exceed my expectations. I tell them that today. Why? Because they matter. It matters what you say. Words are important. They're strong. They're penetrating. You exceed my expectations for a son. And they do, by the way. They do. You know why I know that? Because my dad's told me that. That's the dad I had. And that's the father that we have in heaven. Amen? Listen intently. Love intensely. And live intentionally. Be deliberate in the steps that you take. Teaching and living God's Word is a full-time job. Full-time job. Everywhere we've gone in ministry, I've prayed for a mentor. I pray for someone to come alongside me and give me direction. Someone that would kick me in the pants when I needed it and pat me on the back when I needed it. And you know what? The Lord's always provided. 
And there was a dear man when we lived in Alabama. Our uh, kids were little there. In fact, Luke was born there. And we lived in Alabama for a number of years. And we were coming in the church. I remember it just like it was yesterday. We were coming in. His name was... Uh, uh, John and uh, we were and he went by Bud, but we walked in the church and he said, "Alan, you're going to be a great father because you're always uh, engaging the kids." I had no idea what he was talking about because I've been a father for ten minutes. You know, they were little boys and um, they were in diapers and all that. But it made me feel so good. But I tell you what, it really did. It, I remembered that what he was giving me was not just a compliment; he was giving me direction. He was saying, Alan, be in their life. Don't you let it be a part where you're not in their life. You be in their life. That's what he said in this passage in that we've just read. Be in their life. Be in their life in everything. Always telling them the truth of God's Word. Always being there. Always doing that. It can't be an afterthought. Engaging your kids. Parenting your kids. Leading and discipling your kids. Evangelizing your kids. That can't be something that we, we put off on the side. I told you that we are expecting a grandchild at Christmas, and we're excited about that. And, of course, we're praying for this little baby all the time. I want to invite you to pray with us for this little child. But you know one of the things that we pray is that this baby will come to know the Lord at an early age and that the Lord will use this child in a powerful way because that's what the Lord wants. But Scripture says, train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he's old, he will not depart from it. He will not depart from that. It's not an if-then. If you do this, it's going to work out that. You know why? Because they got a brain. they got a free will. They're going to do their own thing. But your responsibility is to fill their plate. You can't make them eat. But you can fill their plate. My boys are grown and married. They're gone. We have done our best to, to make them godly men. But they could choose themselves to not do that. It's, it's on them at this point. We have to do our part. As a father, I've got to be in their life, even today. This must be showered in. It, must, it can't be poured in. It can't be a water hose. It has to be showered in. It has to be sprinkled in. Or else it's like a hard rain on dry dirt. It's just going to wash, wash right off. It's not going to penetrate. It's not going to saturate. We have to saturate that. We have to let it cook a little bit. Let it simmer a little bit. It's like when, you, when you're cooking, you can't salt at the end of the meal. You gotta, when it's cooking, put it in there, let it get in there a little good. You know what I mean? It tastes differently. See, when, when, we, when we try to just inject it in, try to force it in, it just becomes an add-on. It becomes like you're trying to, to just add it on at the end. We're trying to, to, to show them God apart, compartmentalize it. We're going to go to church on Sunday and make that a part of, of our life. It's just a part. It's like going to math class at school. Math's a part of your life, you know, it, or English or whatever. I can learn that, and you're asking, when am I ever going to use that in my life? Same question. When am I ever going to use this Bible stuff in my life? Life. How's that ever going to look in my life? You know, we have to we have to live His Word out in, at home. We can't just can uh, just uh, put it at church. Every day you go, there's opportunities to do that. Everywhere you go, there's opportunities to 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 engage your your children, your grandchildren, with the truth of God's Word. Especially today, when you watch the news, my goodness. You see, that's the deal is that the moral and ethical standards that God has given us, sometimes we're just not applying it the way that we could at home. We're allowing someone else to come in and do that. But see, the power of God's love, He wants to use that in our home. He wants to apply that every day in our home. John said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Well, they don't just walk in the truth on their own, do they? They have to be taught to walk in the truth. They have to be taught to walk in the truth. How does a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. You know, some say that the family's an endangered species, and maybe it is. I don't know what your family looks like. Maybe your family's on the rope. I don't know. How do you change it? Well, Jesus said in Matthew 7, He said that, Everyone who hears the words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Built his house on the rock. You know, you know the, the passage. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded the house. Yet it did not collapse because the foundation was the rock. But he also said that those who don't listen to him, 
What happens to them? They, they're like a foolish man that built his house on the sand. And when the rivers rose and rain fell, it collapsed. And it collapsed with a great crash. A disaster. Catastrophic. Folks, I determined when we got married, I was a kid. When we had our first kid, I was a kid. But I determined that whatever happened in my life, I would not fail Jane. I would not fail our sons, Will or Luke. You know why? Because my daddy taught me not to do that. My daddy decided that he would listen intently to God. He would love intensely and he would live intentionally. And that's what I've tried to show my boys. That's how we live our life. We didn't come up with this on our own. It's from the Lord's Word. Maybe you say my kids are grown. They're gone. Mine are too. Well, we don't stop being a daddy, do we? We don't stop being a father. We've got grandkids. We've got other folks that may not have a father figure in their life. Maybe the Lord's calling you to be that godly man in their life. Maybe He's calling you to example what it looks like to be a godly man. Folks, it will stand in such contrast to this world just to be an honest, godly gentleman. To treat your wife with respect in front of a boy or a girl. It's a big deal. It's such contrast to this world. The Lord's called us to live, to listen intensely, to love intensely, and to live intentionally. And I pray that today we will make that commitment to do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your love. Thank You for the Word, the truth that it contains. And Father, I pray. I pray that as we are fathers, that we will be found faithful. And that we will do the things that You have called us to do. Father, that we would listen intensely, love intensely, and live intentionally. Father, that we would be found faithful in this. And Father, that our children will grow up and to be godly men and women. Father, they would come to know You at an early age and that they would live their life for You with reckless abandonment to this world. So Father, I pray that as we come to this time of invitation, I pray that as we uh, come face to face with what You want from us in our life, our response to Your Word, I pray that we would not be derelict in, in giving ourselves to You fresh and anew. That, Father, we would be the men and women of God. So, Father, I thank You for Your love and mercy. In Jesus' name, Amen.